Well, I'd like you for, for the moment to consider a line of ice skaters. Okay, so this character in the middle, he's spinning around on, on the spot and the ice dancers are holding on to him and trying to keep up with the spin. He's spinning at a, at a constant um, angular rotation rate. It's not difficult for you to imagine that as you increase this line, you add more um, skaters on there, there's going to come a point where the tensile strength of those arms is not going to be able to sustain the difference in the moment of inertia um, and the line will break. It's inevitable the line's going to break. Okay. But that's not, this is not an accurate model of V-theory. V-theory is now saying something different. V-theory is saying that the coupling between the adjacent spinners, spinning systems, is viscous. So I'm going to ask you to imagine, consider a cylindrical ice skater <laughs> that is coupled with the adjacent rings I'm not going to expect you to follow all of this, but I'm going to explain it in, in, anyway. Um, so consider an elemental volume um, right at the middle. This, this is it, this thing that's um, going out radially. You have rings of fluid around it. So it's a volume element of fluid, and you've got rings of fluid out there, all of width L, the laminar width. So you've built it out let's say on this table, if you will. You've got rings that are all concentric around a central axis. And then you build it up in three dimensions as well. Okay. And they're all coupled by some viscous coupling, which means that they, they're slipping past each other and the one layer is going to drag the other. And you set the central one spinning. My task was to figure out how does the angular velocity vary over space um, around that central spinning volume? And I spent a year, a year trying to figure this model out and come up with a solution for it and then model it on a computer. So here's the modeling. Um, so the simulation is made simple because of angular symmetry. It means that I can take a two-dimensional approach to it. This is not flat. I'm actually slicing this way. The, the z-axis, the z-axis is along here. Where that box with the three in it, that was the spinning elemental volume. Now, what do we see? We're radially out from the elemental volume, the angular velocity is dropping to zero. Going up, it quickly drops to zero. Um, uh, in the z direction. However, along the diagonal, it's not dropping away. It seems like you're getting the contribution from the the the, the radial um, in the radial direction and in the z direction, and they're building up faster than it's decaying. And you see it start to build up. Now I'm going to zoom out a bit, and you start seeing what the velocity field looks like, and it's starting to build up inexorably it builds up it builds up until it starts to tear just like the ice skaters arms broke their grip broke the fluid tears and the tear proceeds in a straight line vertical so as night follows the day if you were to set a volume of fluid spinning that's in a field that is viscously, viscously coupled, you'll induce tearing. So this is a, a slice through the, um, the fluid, this, and, and this is the axis, so it's kind of spinning all the way around. That's the tear that happens. So that, that is actually a circular tear. It's not happening in the plane of the, of the elemental volume. It's happening further up, and there's a mirror one happening further down. Okay, so what's going on here? A vortex is formed. 
So rotation inevitably causes the ether to tear. Two circular hole, holes form, form at a distance from the elemental volume. The interior um, spirals out to the vortex walls by centrifugal force, um, and it leaves a void in the middle. There's nothing in the center. But the wall of the vortex continues to spin, and it continues to spin at that velocity which exceeds the velocity of the adjacent layer to maintain grip. That velocity causes a pressure drop, which causes the viscous coupling to go to zero. And so now you've got a perpetuating vortex, a vortex that continues on its own, where you've got the inter internal layer spinning at the critical velocity, I call it U subscript C, outside the vortex is not spinning at all. There is no, there's no coupling. It's broken off. The only observable is at the mouth of the vortex, two mouths, two holes in the fluid that we can observe that there's, there's something going on. There is a, an angular velocity field that grows um, but, but, but decays away um, from the hole. What's the hole doing? The holes are flying apart from each other at the speed of light, at C, at the maximum speed that the um, fluid um, can support. So, so now we've got this notion that rotation causes a vortex, causes two holes to fly apart, there's nothing in the middle, what are the forces around the holes? What experiments can we do to, to see uh, what this theory uh, would predict? Well, there's zero pressure in the middle, and there's the, the positive pressure of the ether outside. So there's going to be a flow into the hole. And if that hole was stationary, that flow would be great. If the hole's flying at C, the speed of light, that the fluid can't catch up with it. So it would experience no gravitational effect. Put a pin in that, let's go over here. What does the rotation of the hole um, induce? Well, if you had two holes, one spinning clockwise, one spinning anti-clockwise, there'd be a net flow between the two, as we showed over here, a net flow between the two would cause a pressure drop. The pressure of the ether would actually force them together. It would appear to us like that is a force of attraction between these two, but it's really the, 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 the overall ether actually pushing them together. Okay, so not spooky action at a distance. It's actually completely explained by Bernoulli, 1700 AD. Um, so by Bernoulli's principle, we can explain um, electromagnetism, at least the electrical force. The direction of the spin is actually the sign of the charge, if this is the model for the electric field. Okay, so let's, let's recap if, that, if the flow towards the um, hole is gravity, then um, What's going on here? Well, the current theory says um, that, that that gravity is caused by is caused by energy density. The presence of energy in a volume causes space-time to curve, and things will fall towards um, areas of great curvature. Um, the path of light would be bent in an area of curvature. That's how. Um, in general rel relativity it's explained. Interesting thing, as you um, computed what P times V is and you came up with the units of energy, I'd urge you to compute what the units of energy density is. What are the units of energy density 
it turns out it's the same unit as pressure. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. So V theory is saying that gravity is simply the result of pressure differences and the flow of the ether towards low pressure. Okay. That elemental volume I'm calling the graviton, which the standard model doesn't know what the graviton is. But it does predict that it would have the spin of two, which V theory predicts it will have a spin of two. It decays into two spin one particles. It decays into two, what are they? They're photons. Okay, those two holes that are flying apart at the speed of light are in fact photons. Let's just do a detour here um, in the search for dark matter. It's my hunch that at the galactic edge, when particles, when holes are um, in an area of very, very low um, ethereal turbulence, low temperature, um, their spins would align and then you would get a net sort of flow around the um, holes and uh, that, would, that would almost be like a condensation of these holes and uh, it'll be like the skin on your Thanksgiving gravy. Um, the surface tension grip at the edge of the galaxy would cause it to rotate as a rigid body, which is what we observe. And so um, it's not really a search for dark matter. It's a modification of, of gravity, or it's a deeper understanding of gravity and the effects um, uh, that it would have. <clears throat>